morning. Welcome to worship. It was so wonderful to hear. I'm going to sit at the piano, so let me move this so I can see everyone over there. So wonderful to hear everyone visiting this morning, and so wonderful to see you on this first Sunday of August. There were some times I wasn't sure I was going to see the first Sunday of August, and I'm so glad that we are, we are here together, and we are so glad that you are with us in worship. Just a couple of reminders this morning. Um, a reminder that we always have our ongoing collection for MetroCrest, and in the foyer, you'll see a tub that's marked for MetroCrest Food Bank. I'll actually be taking some tomorrow, and I know there's some in the Family Life Center, so we'll, we'll grab all of that up. But if you have anything that you would like to bring, or call the church office, and we will be happy to come and pick that up from you at your house so we can make sure we get that there. I know that we are all aware MetroCrest um, is serving so many families, and the demands on MetroCrest right now have really increased increased drastically um, in the past several months. So as a congregation, I know we want to continue to um, help them serve in our community. Reminder also that on your bulletin, if you are visiting with us, um, there's a little tear-off page on the side, and we would love to have some information from you if you're visiting with us so that we can um, just reach out and tell you how glad we are that you're with us. In addition, if you have prayer requests or anything you need to let the church office know, that's a place, church members, where you can write that down. Put that in our offering um, containers that are on the soundboard and in the foyer, and we'll make sure that that gets to um, the correct person, so to speak. I'm going to very selfishly ask for your prayers, continued prayers, for our schools as um, we are beginning to open. We have uh, several educators in our congregation, and we have many school students, and there's just so much controversy, so much concern um, about the opening coming up, and I know that our administrators, our leaders are leading us as in a wonderful way, the best that they can, but that's certainly something with that being right around the corner. If you will conti continue to keep educators, schools, children in your prayers as we kind of venture into what will be a very diff uh, different fall than any of us have experienced before. I can tell you as a teacher and on, from, for me, and I, I think I speak for Sean and for Chelsea and for some of our other educators, we really are ready to get back and to see our students. Um, but we want to make sure that we are, we are who we need to be for them. So thank you for those prayers. Um, the prelude this morning was actually the hymn tune of our first hymn, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. And I know as a congregation, it's not one that we've sung very much. But if you will see the words up on the screens and our wonderful Celebration Singers girls are going to help lead us in our hymns today. Um, as you stand, we're going to sing that and praise him, praise him. Give a welcome to the neighbors in your neighborhood. And we're going to stand and we're going to sing together, lift our voices in praise.
This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. To this place to get away from what is outside of these walls. We come into this place to find the stillness of God's peace, to rest in him and his abiding love and his abiding grace. The next hymn, Come Away from Russian Hurry, is hymn 302. It's a relatively new one. So I'm gonna ask Madison to sing the first verse so we hear that. Then we're going to join together in singing the third verse. Good morning. Aren't you glad we serve a God who wants to hear what we need and wants us to praise him? There's so many needs in our world and in our church, there are many. Sharon and David Cozart. Sharon has been in the hospital for over five months. We need to pray for her. David and Carol Rains. Abel Tedder's son-in-law, Darnell Gardner, <clears throat> had a hip replacement, second one. He's doing well. Jodell Roberts fell this week and tore ligaments in her foot. At the moment, there's no surgery, but she's on extended bed rest. Betty Toes needs our prayers again. And she had a longtime friend, Warren Henry, had his foot uh, surgery last Sunday, so we need to pray for him. As Kelly mentioned, we need to pray for our leaders related to our school, to our city, to our county, to our state, to our country, and our world needs, we need spiritual awakening. Would you join me in prayer? Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you care about us. You care about all of our needs. The ones we've mentioned, and the many that have not been mentioned, that you care about all of us and whatever needs we have, you're concerned. Thank you for the opportunity to come to your house to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray all things, amen.
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. This is actually a verse when I look at it, it always kind of boggles the mind for a lot of new Christians when I tell, tell them that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Why? I think it's really to fully understand the power and the authority that God has in our lives. And once you understand that God is in control of the situation, that is the first steps of becoming wise. This week, while we go through our Next Steps program, I hope you pray for our church for wisdom, that we fully focus our heart and understand that God is in control of all the situations going on, that he has the power and he has the authority and everything is in, is in his hands. So would y'all pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray and I beg for wisdom. I pray for wisdom for this congregation, for this church, for our, our, for our leaders. But I pray that you guide our hearts and our minds right now to where you want us to be. And let us always be reminded that you are in control of the situation, not us. And that is a wonderful place to be. God, I pray that you continually watch over us on our Next Steps programs and give us guidance in every way. We love you and we say this in your name. Amen.
Blessed be the name of the Lord into whose presence we come this morning. This is a uh, beautiful, sacred place. It's becoming more so uh, for Marilyn and me to come and join with you in uh, worship of God, to study His Word, to allow His Spirit to speak to us, to encourage us in this time, to comfort us. I am delighted to be here with you uh, this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, we had the Old Testament reading earlier for the message today for the sermon. Uh, it's from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. It's the last three verses, verses 28, 29, and 30. If you would like to turn that, uh, turn to that in your Bible, uh, feel free. Uh, words of our Lord again. And uh, I will read them for us. Uh, if you're able, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. If you choose to remain seated, that is not a problem in the world. You just uh, sit and listen as we stand and listen. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in spirit and in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God for it. You may be seated. It is uh, interesting, you've probably already noted two passages uh, that we've read this morning. Pat, thank you for the Old Testament reading there and then the one that I just read. Uh, both uh, passages uh, have in them the word rest. And yet the title of the message is, Let's Get Spiritually Fit. So resting and getting fit. Sometimes it doesn't quite go together. They, one seems to be in juxtaposition of the other. Kind of reminds me of my friend James Kelly. He's a retired Dallas police detective. And uh, he says that often in his life he has the desire to get physically fit. He really wants to get in shape. And so when he gets those feelings, he just lies down for a while until it goes away. Um, I'm, I'm thinking James doesn't want to get physically fit. So, but here we are. Let's get spiritually fit. And at the same time, we're reading in the Bible where it says rest. The Lord is saying here, though, I think something about that process of being spiritually fit. Not, not worthy, not fit in the sense that we are worthy, but fit in the sense that we are spiritually developed. That we are spiritually developed. And that's called discipleship. It was discipleship that the Lord had in mind with the twelve that came to be the ones called out. Therefore, they're called apostles. That's what that word means in Greek, to be called out. But they were disciples. As Jesus sought to disciple the disciples and others that would follow him in that day, so he says to you and me today, I want to disciple you. It's a process. And so he's speaking of it here. Not, not fit as worthy, but spiritually developed. It's discipleship. It's with a goal. The goal is to be the same as physically fit. When we are physically fit, we find ourselves stronger. Being disciples of our Savior means that we are growing stronger as well. To be stronger and to be about in some way, whether it's just walking or it may be going to the gym. Remember those days? I don't know if you ever did that, but uh, it, that, that's kind of a long ago memory. But the idea in going to the gym was that we could become flexible as well as strong we could be flexible. And then as well, it helps to be strong and to be physically fit for uh, fighting immunity. Well, spiritually fit also means that there are those things that uh, means that we are stronger, that we are flexible, that we are uh, immune from those things that we should not have in our lives. So spiritually fit has about it discipleship and it has about it the goal to be fit for the Savior. In Matthew 11, 28 to 30, here are these verses. Jesus points out, 
in a very picturesque way, I believe. It's a, it's a beautiful picture of how you and I are to go about achieving personal spiritual growth. Uh, learn from me. Jesus says it. It's there in those verses. Learn from me. That's the meaning of discipleship. Learn from Jesus. It's at the same time a wonderful invitation because Jesus is saying, come and be discipled by me to the process, in the process of personal development. I want you to grow spiritually, Jesus is saying. There is nothing stagnant. There's nothing status quo about following Christ. He's always on the go. He's always up to something. He's always headed somewhere. And so he says to you and me, I, I have something for you to do. And so I, I want you to be discipled by me. Come and be discipled by me. That beautiful invitation. So let's begin at the beginning, so to speak. And let's say that uh, you have professed faith in Jesus Christ. You have professed faith in that you believe Jesus is the Son of God. God in the flesh came to the earth. He walked on the earth in the form of a person. He gave the teachings. He performed the miracles. Here Jesus was God's Son on the earth, and you believe that about Him. God's only begotten Son. You believe that. In fact, you believe that to the point that you trust Him. You trust God with your life. You believe in Jesus enough that you want to follow Him, to be a disciple of His. That you trust Him for your eternal destiny. That's what it is to profess faith in Jesus as your personal Savior. Now we often say Lord and Savior. I may have said it earlier today myself. The truth is, the sequence is, that you see, He comes to be our Savior first, and then we make Him Lord of our lives. We accept Him as Savior, and then we say, Jesus is Lord. The baptisms that I performed uh, in my previous church over the years, that's one of the things I would ask the person standing beside me in the baptismal waters, what is your profession of faith? And then they would know to say, sometimes quite nervous, but they would know to say, Jesus is Lord. That's our profession of faith. We trust Him as our Savior. He is our Lord. And so we come to that point of baptism, that point of profession of faith, and that is faith that says, Jesus is Lord of my life. So we follow Him in baptism. That's the reason in Baptist churches, I went back here this morning, that's the reason in the Baptist churches, uh, other churches as well, we're not the only ones, but that's the reason for us as Baptists, the baptistry is in a place of prominence. It's kind of front and center. Oh, well, for most of our churches, it's rear and center. But, but the idea is that that's why the baptistry is there. Because we want to profess our faith that Jesus is Lord. And at the same time, to show witness, to give witness of Christ's death, His burial, and His resurrection. And we do it over and over again as people follow Christ and they're baptized so that we might have that message in our hearts and lives reinforced in our minds that Jesus is Lord. He's our Lord. And so we're baptized uh, into that faith. It's a part of what we know about our Christian walk. So let's say that you've experienced all of these things. Where do we go from here? Where do we go following baptism? Um, it reminds me, and I think part of the answer is, that my dad um, drove a bus uh, in the military. That was a part of what he did, so following his service there, he drove a bus uh, as a job. It was uh, full-time, uh, some of the long-distance drives, in fact. And so he drove a bus. Later, he and my uncle got into construction business, but it was my dad who taught me how to drive. He was a good driver. And I drove a bus all those years. He says there were not accidents, no one injured. He had a good record, and so he was a good driver. He taught me to drive. Now, my dad also taught me to drive what is called a manual transmission. 
Uh, well, it was called that in those days. Mostly today we have automatic transmissions in cars, by the way, but then it was a manual transmission. Anybody here know what a manual transmission is? Okay. Anybody here drive a manual transmission? Okay. Anybody here grind the gears in a uh, manual? Anyway, it was the old manual transmission. And it was probably some of the most special times in my life with my dad because on Sunday afternoons, we would go out when I was learning to drive and he would teach me to drive. We would go out on these little back country roads. They were dirty, dusty, they, they were just gravel roads, they were safe, didn't see many cars, which was probably a good thing, you know, when you're learning to drive. And my dad would teach me to drive. Uh, he taught me to drive, just like my own personal driver's ed teacher and he he taught me and we had just a wonderful time doing it uh, covered most of the roads in that county in fact one really personal word because it means so much to me when we were out there driving around my dad always liked to find these little what we call country stores and uh, it's amazing how they were out there sometimes like in the middle of nowhere and we would stop in there and get a cold drink where you would walk over to the cold drink they, they were cold drinks because they were like uh, soda pops my dad called them and they were in the ice it, it you'd get frostbite reaching in there to get one I mean they were cold and we'd stop at these little stores my dad would talk to the the storekeeper and it, just wonderful wonderful special blessed times learning to drive and uh, my dad would cover most of these uh, country roads. You see, that's what it is to follow Christ in some ways. Uh, that's, that's what it's like. That's what we do to follow Christ. We take roads. And we take lots of them. And some of them are kind of back roads, and they're dirty, and they're dusty, and, and some of them are not well-traveled by others, but they're our roads. And and a part of discipleship is going down some of those roads with Jesus. And he's teaching us all kinds of things along the way. We take the roads, a lot of them. My dad and I always had a goal uh, when we went on those roads. We never, my dad didn't speak in terms of goal or leadership management. But I knew it was our goal. Our goal was to get back home safely. Sometimes we were out there in the middle of nowhere. I, I didn't know where we were. I'm sure glad my dad did. The truth is now I don't know that he did. He just thought if you keep driving, you'll, we'll find something we know and, and we go there. But we had a goal to get back home safely. You see, there is a goal in the Christian life. There is a goal that is following baptism. And that is that we walk the roads with our Savior as we make Him the Lord of our lives. And so He becomes Lord and we find ourselves walking more closely with Him and staying close to Him in all of the circumstances, in all of the seasons, in all of the experiences of life. Where do we go from baptism? It's not just church membership. It is also to become a full-grown, well-developed disciple of Jesus. That's for all of us, to grow in His Word, to grow in our relationship with Him. Jesus' vivid picture of this uh, process in, in these verses is the idea of uh, a yoke. Learn from me, He says, but learn by taking a yoke upon you. Well, I'm going to tell you for a second reason. You can tell I, I'm from the country. Uh, and so we had, we had yokes. I know what a yoke that you put on an animal is. And so I, I surely don't think I'm the only one here. Anybody here know what a yoke is? You know, you ever, okay, anybody here ever put a yoke on an animal? Do you know? Oh, good. I, well, thank you. Uh, one. And so uh, uh, the idea of the yoke, it's kind of a big, heavy, heavy, leathery thing in a way. But what it was used for in the time of Jesus, used for through our days today, especially in a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, they, they use them. But there are three reasons for the yoke. And so I'll, I'll share these with you because I think Jesus is saying, here's what you do with the yoke. And here's how you become a disciple. First of all, the yoke was, to, uh, was uh, putting the animal under submission to and control of, submission to and control of the person sitting on the wagon seat or on the plow. It was to 
put the animal into submission, to control so that they would plow in the right places, straight line, they would get the, the load carried. And so the yoke is a sign, it has a meaning of submission to Jesus Christ. That's a part of our discipleship. That's what Jesus, I think, was saying here, that in discipleship, Christ is seeking our surrender, our surrender, our um, submission to Him. He wants to bring us under his control. In all honesty, I will share with you, friends, when he wants us under control does not mean that we're some type of wild, renegade person necessarily. It does for those that are like that. But there's a submission also that's needed by folks like you and me. And that is that we're not wildly out of control, but the truth is we, we, we just really haven't submitted to the Lord every day in every way. It, it, a part of His submission says to you and me, you got to live outside yourself. There's something bigger going on than just how it is for you. There, there's something that I want you to see as a disciple of mine that says we care about the folks that Metrocrest serves. There's something that we can do when we give our money, not only in keeping of the God's house and staff and those things, but it's something that helps us to be under control by our Savior because we get outside of ourselves. It's a yoke of sharing, being open to sharing, being willing to share. So it's a sign of submission. The second thing is the yoke speaks of work to be done. It implies responsibility. Great word. I love the meaning of responsibility. You know what it is? It's the ability to respond. And, and Jesus is saying, I've, I've got something for you. I've got, I've got something for you to do. I've got somewhere for you to go. I've got something that is about being a follower of mine that says we're active. Maybe not energetic. I'm finding through the years, I, I'm, I'm afraid my get up and go has got up and went uh, on some days. Uh, but, but you know what I'm saying. We, we've got something to do. We've, we've got a responsibility. It gives us those things to do because God saved you and He saved me to bring upon you the right kind of responsibility. There is purpose. There's something that God wants to accomplish through your life. In fact, I'm here to say to you in the middle of COVID. God has something for you to do. And I dare say that it's something that only you can do. You know, we speak about Jesus being a personal Savior. <clears throat> Pardon me. But I think that's the personal Savior part. Jesus is very individual. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what makes us think. He knows what wakes us up in the middle of the night. Jesus is personal, and so He has something <clears throat> that has only your fingerprints on it to do. It's something about, something about the Savior's way of doing things. It's a way of giving us the responsibility that, that He cares for. There's a purpose uh, in our lives. So you can do it by being yoked with Him together with Christ. And the third process... Uh, Part of the process, third purpose, uh, is to train a younger animal how to pull uh, with the yoke. I did not know this until this week and looking at this passage and studying this thing. I always thought you had kind of two animals pulling in, in a two-team yoke. You had two animals, they both pulled. But it's uh, very good, very likely, very expert in the way in which a person putting the yoke on and how they would rig that yoke, that they could have an older, stronger animal there with a younger, not as strong animal there. And the way they would set up that yoke is that the older animal would pull more of the weight. Isn't that amazing? I always thought a yoke was just kind of a yoke. It's, it's there. Both sides are the same. That's one of the beautiful things I see about our church here. There are a lot of older folks who have a lot of knowledge that can help a lot of younger people. Maybe they're not as young as the ones who were uh, leading us here today, but it's that they can help 
we can help as older to reach and to lead and to teach the younger. One of the things that I sense around here is that we have that. Younger and older, there are those that are younger. Jesus wants us as disciples to follow him in discipling others. And sometimes those are younger. Uh, I'm not here to tell you about the church where I, I served. I'm trying not to do that. I had a good experience there. They're wonderful people. But I think this is the first time I've mentioned them as an example. But one of the things I liked about our church was that older adults knew the names of the younger adults. The younger adults, even students, knew the names of the older adults. There's something about this cross-generational thing that says to me that is church. That is something that makes a beautiful part of the fellowship of Jesus Christ that says to me, you know, I'm, I'm not real good with names. I see that person Sunday by Sunday, but I think there's something about discipleship of Jesus Christ that says you have the license, you have the authority, if you need that, to walk up to someone that might be quite younger or quite a bit older than you and say, I'd like to know your name. For me, uh, my name's given by my mom and dad. It was a disc jockey that they listened to when they were dating. Larry Wayne. Maybe you've heard of him. More than likely not. But anyway, they listened to this disc jockey, and so they named me for a disc jockey. I was really hoping it might be some great preacher or, you know, somebody. But it's all right. I'm sure he's a wonderful man. He was a great disc jockey, I guess. My parents listened to him. But your name is yours. It's personal. It matters. That's why I'm asking you to help me with your name. Because I'd like to know your name. I'd like for you to know mine. You see, because in some ways in doing that, you become very Christ-like. Jesus knows your name. Jesus knows mine. You're not just the congregation here today. He knows you by your name. In fact, the book of Psalms says something about his name, uh, your name is engraved on the palm of his hand. God doesn't just have a hand like we have a hand we know, but it's a beautiful picture of the psalmist. God's name is engraved. Your name is in, engraved on God's hand. God has your name there. I guess another way of saying it is that uh, if God has a refrigerator, don't know that he does, but if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. He'd be proud of you. He'd have your picture on it. God loves you. God wants you to follow Him. And so the invitation today is quite simple. Where are you in your discipleship? You could be a flourishing, full-on, spiritually fit, spiritually fit disciple of Christ, and that's wonderful. Let me encourage you. For some of us, and I'm one of them, I tend to think there's some room for me to grow. I, I can spend a little more time in prayer, praying for my brothers and sisters in Christ in this church. I can pray for people I hear about, know about, uh, John sharing a while ago and the list. I, I can remember those people. I can, I can be about reading God's Word. Maybe it's going to take getting up a little earlier, staying up a little later, whatever uh, your rhythm is. But it's, I, I, I can grow in the Lord. That's how I feel. And so if that be more your situation, then I invite you today, maybe it's just in the privacy of where you stand, to say, I, I really want to walk closer to the Lord. I, I want to be a stronger disciple of His. I, I want to be a more spiritually fit person. And that's how we do it. We read His Word. We pray to Him. Uh, I went Tuesday afternoon. I, I was in the office for a while on Tuesday afternoon. By the way, I, I have a claim to fame now, I guess, in your church. Uh, the police came uh, when I was here Tuesday afternoon because I didn't get the alarm right. Uh, uh, all the coaching, teaching, uh, Debbie's helped me. Uh, anyway, 
punching in those numbers. And actually, the, they didn't call the police. The police came. The, the policeman was across the street in the parking lot. I mean, that's not coincidence. But at any rate, not coincidence to me. But anyway, so Felipe comes over, and he says, is there a problem? And I said, well, yes. Um, evidently, I'm not pushing the buttons hard enough or something. And I said, I've, I've been here three weeks, and I'm really sorry to do this to you. But um, I'm, uh, I, I set off the alarm. So he started punching in the code. Now I'm thinking, Felipe's out there somewhere. He's got my code. But anyway, uh, he has to get in the front door. He doesn't have that code. But uh, anyway, I, um, I set off uh, the alarm. I was here on Tuesday afternoon. But while I was here, I got the idea. I felt like it was of the Lord. He led me down the way to the Chamber of Commerce. I had a good relationship with the Chamber of Commerce in the town where Merrill and I uh, live and, and uh, where I served as pastor there. And, and so I went to the Chamber of Commerce. I, I met a fellow there. He said an interesting thing to me. He said, oh, so you're the, the new pastor. He, I don't know that he quite understood interim and, you know, next steps process or anything. But he said, oh, you're the, the new pastor at First Baptist Church. I said, well, I am the interim pastor. He said, oh, you're there to take... Brother Sam's place. And I'm really grateful that I thought of quickly enough in that instance to say, nobody can take Brother Sam's place. You know, the truth is, and what I'm hearing over and over again from our church members, I'm not here to take Brother Sam's place. Let me tell you why I'm here. I'm here to stand in the gap. I want to help you to walk as closely with the Lord as you can. I want for our church to grow and reach people because that's what any church is supposed to do. And I think that's what Brother Sam would be most pleased with. I think it is up to each one of us as followers of Jesus Christ that we do what we can to honor our Lord. And so we say to others, and I did, I invited the guy. I have no reason not to. I mean, I assume he has a mask. He can come in and join us for worship. So, uh... I think that's what, why we're here. We're not here just to sit, hunker down, and wait out the pandemic. We're here to be disciples of Christ. And I don't think Jesus calls us to remain in the huddle. He is saying to us, there are things for us to do. So I invite you today. There may be a particular thing you want me to pray with you about. I'll put on my mask. I'll meet you here at front. Maybe you want to drop me a, a note. Maybe you want to email me at church. Kelly, help me on this, but I believe my email address is Larry at fbcfb.org. Okay, I'm learning it. I got it now. Email me. I uh, gave my number last week. It's in one of the newsletters. Text me. Uh, I'm trying to get back to everybody. We, we really have had a good number of folks that have responded. I want that because we are here to be disciples of Christ and do what the Lord wants us to do even in these days, these days between pastors. So, would you pray with me? And then we'll, we'll just pray and give this uh, public invitation uh, to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit, to do what would honor God our Heavenly Father. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful to you that you allow us, you call us to be followers of yours. I, th I think it was John who said at the first of the service today, isn't it wonderful that we have a God that cares about us. He wants to know about the prayer request. And so we say to you today, Father, we, we want to follow you. We want to follow you. We want to do what you have for us to do. And so, Lord, bless our church. Father, I'm, I'm just really here to stand between the pastors, between Brother Sam and the next pastor that comes. I'm standing the gap. Only the gap is not a void. It's not an emptiness. I think it's an acrostic, the G-A-P, stands for God answers prayers. And so we're going to make prayers to you now that you would help us to be the kind of disciples that you want us to be. And I pray that a part of that is lived out in these times of invitation because we know that Jesus died for our sins. Father, the message has been shared that you want us to be in relationship with you that is one in which we are saved. We are forgiven of our sins. We are given a new life. We can walk with you. And one in which we are called by you to be taught and to learn from you. Bless this time, I pray. In that strong name, wonderful name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's stand together. If you're able, we'll sing. 
You respond as the Spirit leads. Good morning to all of you. Good afternoon. I hope you have a wonderful... This sounds kind of muffled, doesn't it? So let me do this. Don't mean to scare you, but I'll move over here. I uh, hate wearing these things. Uh, but I'll wear two of them if it helps somebody to come to church. I'll wear three of them <laughs> if it helps people stay well and not be afraid to come to church. And that's what I'm hearing from some of our people. So it makes me want to put it on again right now. But uh, just so you can hear me, hear me clearly, Lord bless you this week. Uh, Kelly, Sean, what do we, else do we need Pray to share? It. Pray it out. Pray it out? Yes. Pray it out. All right. Kelly, is it fair? Do you, we haven't announced this, but I know you pray. So do you mind praying the benediction? Or do you want to sing it? Oh, no, I don't want to sing it. You don't want to sing it? You pray us out. Father, we thank you again for this time, for this church, for this place. We thank you for Larry. We thank you for sending him to us and his reminder to us that we are all disciples. And learning how to follow you is, is something that we continue to learn every day. We pray that as we leave this place that we are seeking out your will, that we open our eyes, we open our ears to all of the opportunities you place before us every day to reach out to those around us. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.